when you think the Jaws obsession can't possibly break new ground in Jaws analytics. You tune in to this 64th episode and we are back to inspire and to once again share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you for joining me back here in the Jaws obsession. This episode 64, Quint Inspiration. Yes, I'm back. I am back from our visit to England from the hometown of Robert Shaw, West Houghton. And I am inspired, and I hope that after this remarkable episode, you are inspired as well. What if I were to tell you that Jaws fans still, after 48 years, can dig up historical facts on Jaws lore, still finding historical connections in the movie even to this day? Well, it's true. On today's show, we are going to have a recap of the events in England. I have the audio of the speech that I delivered, and then we will have a special guest on the show. And in this interview, we will emerge with a name going forward for the rest of our Jaws watching lives will have to be known as the real-life inspiration for Robert Shaw's USS Indianapolis Survivor monologue. That's correct. We found the sailor's name, rank, and irrefutable proof that this man inspired the infamous monologue that we all know and revere so much in the movie Jaws. This is as important as of an episode as we'll ever have, so we obviously have a lot to get into, we have a lot to unpack, and as always, I appreciate your time in being here on this journey. Very exciting. So let's not waste any time. Let's jump right into, if you remember in episode 63... We had Hayden Wheeler on, one of the organizers of the novel celebration for Robert Shaw that was in West Houghton, the greater Manchester area in the United Kingdom over in England. Tatiana and I flew over to England. We we flew from uh, Syracuse to Chicago, Chicago to Frankfurt, Germany, and then Frankfurt to Manchester. And then in Manchester, we were able to get a car ride up to West Houghton to the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub. So Hayden and Sheila met us there with Chris Buckley. And Chris was a major influence in the organization of this event, which was fabulous. The weather was perfect for me. It was a blustery, it was a it was blustery at times and a little on the cool side, which I am fine with. Uh, I love jacket weather. So that was not a problem. We had Jaws fans as well as uh as well as members of the West Houghton Community Network and Historical Society that showed up as well. It was such a welcoming atmosphere at this event. The Robert Shaw Pub had balloons out there. They had a Jaws balloon, uh, decorations 
it was great to actually get out into the courtyard where to see all the Robert Shaw memorabilia, uh, Robert Shaw placards hanging. The, the energy was everything that I hoped it would be, and then some. For anyone that's interested, and I'm going to link to this on our show notes, uh, Chris has a great article that he wrote up over at the West Houghton Community Network site. I'm going to uh, put that link up on our show notes. And if you want to follow his play-by-play, he did an excellent write-up there. Along with pictures, we had Hayden Wheeler was pretty much the day's photographer. And there's some excellent pictures out there of the day and how it went. I put a series of them on a couple posts over at our Instagram. If you go to Instagram.com at Book of Quint, you can see those photos there as well. We opened up the event with a speech where I delivered some remarks regarding the Book of Quint and how important a role Robert Shaw played, not just to the character of Quint, but into the writing, into uh, my research and writing the Book of Quint as well. So with that, let's go right into, this is my speech on July 1st, 2023, that opened up this novel celebration for Robert Shaw from West Houghton in the greater Manchester area, England. Robert Shaw, titan of an actor who means so much to so many around the world. I have to admit, three years ago, when I first felt the emotional connection, the moment where this story of Quint began to form, I understood the massive scale of the task at hand, and I was intimidated. Like Matt Hooper handing his soft hands over to Quint, how could I possibly stare into this character and not be at a loss for words? The answer was in Robert Shaw. During the summer of 1974, while filming Jaws, Robert Shaw became Quint by bringing more of himself to this role than any other role he performed in his life. The chaotic nature of the Jaws production, the loose script, the unfinished and improvised scenes, allowed for Mr. Shaw to bring moments of his culture, his past, his passions, and his genius to Quint. Before I pressed one letter into a keyboard, 14 months of research went into writing preparation. During this time, I studied Robert Shaw, the man and his life, his family, his movies, and his writings. The more I learned of Robert Shaw, I realized I was learning about Quint. The movie Jaws was always about family. On the Jaws Obsession podcast, I try to show Jaws isn't just a monster shark movie, it's a human movie that happens to have a monster shark in it. In my younger years, I saw it as a family movie, the depiction of a Brody family, how a husband and wife and a father and children interact in the face of a great threat three men working together on the water, then developing a family bond. The family aspects of Jaws are not limited to what's inside the movie. The experience of family and friends while watching the film is just as powerful. Many of my childhood memories were not from the events in the movie. It was how my family was together while watching Jaws. 48 years of bringing us together in theaters and drive-ins around the television set We all have our own personal memories of family and Jaws, but the commonality is for two hours and three minutes, we are together. Without Robert Shaw, it would never have been possible. His Quint becomes our grandfather, father, uncle, leader, teacher, and captain all in one. When he looks into Hooper's eyes halfway through Jaws, he looks into all of us as if to say, this is my movie now. A commanding and legendary performance. The Book of Quint, is dedicated to Robert Shaw and Mary York. You'll see that in the opening page. An acting powerhouse couple that took the stages and cinemas by storm. But without them, Quint would never have been. I know all too well that a family and a career can't work without the support and sacrifice of a spouse. To accommodate Robert's hectic shooting schedule, many times Mary would put her acting career on hold to tend to the children. And when the troubled production of Jaws went over schedule, trapping Robert on Martha's Vineyard, Mary traveled with the kids to stay with Robert on the island in a production that seemed to never end. Complicated and driven was their relationship, with family always rising to the top of priorities. Countless photographs of Robert surrounded by his children at home or on set told me so much about the man. Mary Yer helped helped to create the moment in time during the summer of 1974, when Robert immersed himself in the character of Quint, while able to relax with his family off set, the greatest character performance of all time was born. Mary Yura passed away in the spring of 1975 and never saw her husband's greatest performance on screen, with Jaws premiering only a few months later. 
Robert Shaw left us in 1978. Far too soon. Of Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus is quoted as saying, he left us far too soon. In 2015, Richard Dreyfus wrote, quote, I miss him more than, more than even then I knew, because recently I was on an Irish talk show and was introduced to his granddaughter, who, who he had never met, and I burst into uncontrollable tears. I think because a part of me still grieves at what I could have learned and how spectacular a companion he was. That was from Richard Dreyfus. Like Robert Shaw, Quint is, is taken from us far too soon in the movie Jaws. We only know him for a few days and then he is gone. If only to have a few more days with him, what could we learn? This was the genesis of the book of Quint. Robert Shaw left so much of himself in the character of Quint. If we can know more about Quint's story and spend time in his world, experience his legend, then we are also spending time with Robert Shaw, a few more moments with the man himself. Three years ago, I started this process. 14 months of research, 12 months of writing, eight editorial revisions, legal permissions, and ultimately bringing this book to a limited publication of only 300 copies. As I stand here before you in West Houghton, in the town where Robert Shaw was born 96 years ago, I feel we are part of the same family, coming together to experience a gift Robert Shaw has given us. The story of Quint is far greater than we can ever understand. And it, was detail, and it was the details Robert Shaw left inside the character that tells us the story. So, it is only fitting that on this day, we will now have the first public reading of the prologue to the Book of Quint and be introduced to the latest character in the Jaws universe. A character inspired by Robert Shaw and his family he created. Growing the Jaws family in the hometown of Robert Shaw, it doesn't get any more cinematic than this. Thank you for all your support in this next step in the journey to West Houghton and the United Kingdom. I present to you the Book of Quint. And right after those words, we had a local actor and voice talent, Colin, stepped up. We had a reading from the prologue and then chapter 21 from the Book of Quint. So shortly after the reading, and it was great to experience the reading, Colin did a great job having, um, especially with the accent, especially with that chapter 21, hearing the Quint dialogue expressed with that Robert Shaw flavor. It was great to, it was great to hear. It was great to take in. So after the reading, we then saw copies of the book were presented to various representatives of the local community. We had the Bolton Library. Anne Burns was there representing the Bolton Libraries. She would receive three books that were then turned over to the public libraries there and be made available to borrow by local readers. We had Nicola Walsh from the West Houghton High School was there, and she would actually receive a book that will then go over to the high school as well. We also had the West Houghton Local History Group, Marion White, was representing them, and she was able to receive a book as well. A, a local dramatic group uh, representative, Peter Schofield, stepped up to read a synopsis of the life of Robert Shaw. And that was great to get a little history of Robert Shaw as he was born in, and lived his younger years in West Houghton. It was a great little moment for, um, for all of those who were there, including myself. Uh, then we had the raffle. We had Sheila and Hayden. They organized this uh, the great raffle process where we had a yellow barrel and uh, Tatiana drew numbers out of the yellow barrel and we were able to raffle off three books to three lucky winners. Uh, we also have to thank Bad Hat Harry, who's from Three Yellow Barrels over at Instagram at Three Yellow Barrels. He contributed prizes, alternate prizes as well. So we had more to give away than just the three books in order to raise funds for shark research in the UK via the Basking Shark Scotland and the Angling Trust. So everybody was coming together and it was just, it was, it was, it was a great time. After the raffle drawing, we had a question and answer where people could ask about the book and uh, certain elements of the, of the book, or as well as the development from book to screen process that's still ongoing with the William Pettit Agency in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a nice time. We, uh, we also had other representatives. We had Kimberly, obviously Kimberly came, came through big time. She was able to take a few books 
up to Cumbria and bring them to the local schools and libraries up there. She was also a raffle winner, so she also got a book of Quint herself, which was great to see. We then had a tour of, we had a walking tour of West Houghton. And this is how, it was such a remarkable time. We started out by going to see the placard honoring Robert Shaw, as West Houghton is his hometown, his place of birth. We were, uh, the weather kind of uh, made us, we, we went inside to do some book signings and some photos because the weather started to get a little bit spotty, a little bit rainy. So it delayed us just enough that when we got to the first location on the walking tour, we ended up at the same time, we ended up crossing paths with a gentleman who stopped to tell us that his grandmother was Robert Shaw's babysitter. And he told us the house that Robert Shaw's father, the Dr. Shaw, would have had a surgery practice out of. And he told us the location of that. So it just so happened that, and, and none of the, and, and none of us knew there was a, uh, the location of this second house. But now that we did, we added that to the walking tour. So the 16 faithful Jaws fans, Jaws Obsession listeners that hung out after the event, from there we went to Robert Shaw's, uh, the house that Robert Shaw was born in. Thanks to Nicola Walsh, she allowed us access into the house. So we got to see the sitting room. We got to see the back courtyard the little garden in the back, all these areas that a young Robert Shaw, little toddler Robert Shaw would have been playing around. It was, it, it, and there's a plaque right on the outside of the house. It was a great little moment. It was so great of her, of Nicola, to welcome us into her house, to show us around, and we can actually, and, and, and so much was original, the original exterior, the original, uh, the original wood, so much of the house is still original. Um, the slate roof I was looking at, and I was just realizing that the connection, the energy that was there was palpable, and it was great to see. And from there, uh, we all left there, and then we went back through a park, and we a couple more blocks, a couple more streets to navigate, and there we were outside where the family would then have moved to where Robert Shaw's father had a surgery practice out of one side of the house, and the other side house was where the family lived. We just happened to bump into the owner, uh, Mr. Dave Price, and he gave us a full history of the house. We saw one of the original apple trees that belonged to the Shaw family, and then we actually saw the original stone entranceway where it's printed surgery on it, indicating that this was where the surgery practice was located. So that stonework is still there after all these years. It was great to see. The Robert Shaw connections were, were amazing. Then we ended up back at the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub, and we were talking about everything. We talked about Jaws. We, we, it was a great time to be there with Dan Carver, Andy Curry, to meet so many people that would write into the show that I have met through the recording process, through the broadcasting of the Jaws Obsession, but also the writing of the Book of Quint uh, readers. Dave Bowen was there. We had Dale, the linesman. Remember, he went over to Martha's Vineyard and brought his book of Quint over there and photographed it at all the Jaws locations. And that was on our Instagram, Book of Quint Instagram. Uh, so to meet Dale was great. And he brought he get, he brought T-shirts, Book of Quint T-shirts. Um, so I left with those. And great to meet Donna there. We had a short conversation about what the future holds for the expanded Jaws universe. It just shows that Jaws is about human-to-human -human connection. There's something more about this film that brings communities together, that brings people together. Bad Hat Harry was there. And the comments by everyone involved, I was extremely humbled and extremely grateful about the words of support for the Book of Quint that I received over there. And I can't thank everyone enough that showed up and voiced their support. Then I was introduced to British pub life. Bradley Green was there with his dad, Tony Green. And then I, they introduced me to British pub life, which is an experience all unto itself. And I realized just how addictive it can be because you, I felt right at home. It was great to talk about everything and anything. I could actually see that the tradition that Robert Shaw had with these great writers and great actors where they would go and spend time in these pubs 
there, there's an energy and there is a atmosphere that I cannot, that I never experienced before coming from the United States. It's not here. You have to go over there. You actually have to experience it. So it was great to talk to Bradley, meet his dad, Tony. And we made new, we made future Jaws fans out of people who have never seen the movie, like Rachel McGinley was there. After seeing the event and seeing the uh, and seeing things that were happening, is interested in reading the book of Quint, and she's going to go watch Jaws. So we created more Jaws fans. Her husband, Jamie McGinley, uh, promised me a round of snooker when I return, and I'm going to take him up on that. So Jamie, get ready. We're going to find that table. It was just a great time to experience British pub life like that at the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub. If you are a Jaws fan in the United States, that's a destination you simply must go to just to say you were there, that that's ground zero for the man who gave us the performance of Quint, Robert Shaw. All in all, it was we were there for eight hours. That's how addictive it was. It was two and a half hours uh, that was scheduled, but we were ended up being there for eight hours. I can't thank Adam and Julie of the Robert Shaw enough for their hospitality, and I'm glad that we were able to get a book to that pub so it will be on display there so people that come in there can actually thumb through the pages and grab a pint and and read from the book of Quint as well. So it's great it was a great time, very very successful event and I can't wait to do it again. So let's bring all of the all of what happened into proper perspective. For this episode 64, I want to bring on one of the attendees of last week's Robert Shaw event. So at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome to the Jaws Obsession Dan Carver calling in from England. Dan, thanks for coming on the show today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a- great. Thank you. Absolutely. Great to have you. One of the great aspects of the Jaws Obsession is getting a chance to meet others where Jaws has played a deep role in their lives as it has mine. One of the things, when we met last week at the event, it, we just it was some great words were exchanged, and I felt a great sense of encouragement from you and your words of encouragement that were, where you reached out to me. And um, I want to thank you for that. For, thank you for that because um, it's been quite the event getting to where we are now. And I wanted to start off this uh, with your appearance on the Jaws Obsession. Uh, what were your What are your first memories of Jaws, and how has it carried you through your life? Yeah, well, um, Jaws. I mean, what a what a movie. I mean, anyone that ever watched it mm-hmm. would have uh, been impacted by it just almost instantly, to be honest. And um, for me, probably eight or nine years old, growing up, I was out living in the countryside here in England, in the middle of nowhere, and uh, my parents put Jaws on. Um, You know, and I watched that probably behind my hands for most of it, absolutely terrified. Um, But, I mean, it it just hit me. I was like, you know, after that, I was completely obsessed with sharks in general. But, you know, the film was like there in my mind, you know, the music, the imagery. I distinctly remember being sitting on an armchair watching the movie when, uh, you know, the peer incident happened when Charlie was swimming and he was saying, don't look back, don't look back, swim for it, Charlie. You oh, know, what a scene, right? your feet out the water. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I remember having my feet like up, up underneath my chin, sort of keeping my feet off the floor. <laughs> and, I, you know, it was just like such a monumental sort of uh, impact on a, a young mind. And, um, yeah, so from, from, from that moment onwards, it was just like, uh, you know, every, everything that, you know, my parents tell me about me growing up was just sharks, sharks, sharks. You know, all, all the books I had were sharks. I, wow. My parents painted a massive shark on the wall in my bedroom, you know, and I was just obsessed by it. And then obviously sort of like Jaws T-shirts and things like that just sort of went from there, really. And um, that was my first introduction to Jaws. It's almost a mirror image of my childhood growing up. It's just, we're <laughs> we're kind of two brothers in many ways because that's that just how I had shark books, drawing sharks, everything. My parents would every they would seek out anything. And remember back then it was the, the shark stuff was kind of rare, right? Wasn't it? It wasn't as yeah, definitely prolific as it is today. In many ways, that Jaws kind of helped the interest in sharks. Yeah, I would say like one of you know when you was a kid, you used to do like. Uh, days where you took your interest in you know you you know some kids would come in with model airplanes or whatever and and i took a set of shark jaws that my dad had given me you know sure. brought them back from australia and uh, i took that in as my sort of you know and with a load of drawings of sharks and things like that and i remember like all the kids sort of like you know all crowding around and wanting to hold the jaws and things like that and it was yeah you know it was a unique thing i suppose you know, in in our little town sure. um, for anyone to see anything about 
sharks you know it was pretty much new and uh, yeah so i definitely think you know that that's what you're sort of brought out i mean obviously a lot of negative side of it with the shark yep um, fishing and killing and things like that which we can't escape but yep. you know the the actual uh, sharks were brought into the limelight probably for the first time. You grew up in Australia, or did you say your dad was from Australia? No, my, my dad went to Australia, and he brought oh, me back okay. the shark jaws. I did live. I did actually live in Australia for a year when I was in my 20s, All um, right. and uh, some of my family do live in Australia now. So, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's, a big, there's a good good Australian connection, you know. And there's a big shark connection there, too, with the, the Taylors, right? Ron and Valerie Taylor. And Oh, yeah, I mean, Ron and Valerie Taylor. I mean, you know, growing, growing up as a kid, obviously I got into sharks off the back of jaws, but all the books that I read were nearly all the photos in them were Val and Ron Taylor's photos right. you know so I, I probably knew who they were before I knew who Steven Spielberg was you, you know, know we're, we're gonna have to I'm gonna have to dive into them in another episode of the Jaws <laughs> obsession because they're their real life oh, footage of the shark right real live great white footage that was in Jaws uh, that kind yeah. of helped bridge that fascination of uh, what a real shark looks like underwater and all that when documentaries were few and far between back then I remember as a child, we, we you had Jaws. That was the, you know that was the one your one chance to see the great a great white shark over and over again. If you just put the VHS on mm. over and over again, so yeah. that their that their contribution by way of Jaws into the fascination of sharks um, that really we should have to we we should dive into that because uh, there's yeah a, definitely you know there's a lot to go over with that. But yeah, Ron and Valerie Taylor, how could you not mention them uh, when you're talking about growing up with sharks? I want to get back to over a week ago, since we all met in West Houghton for a celebration of Robert Shaw. Uh, what are your thoughts on that event in retrospect? Because you were there alongside uh, Jaws fans and other listeners of the Jaws Obsession. We were able to retrace the very roots of Robert Shaw on that walking tour and the, and the discovery of the surgery house. What are your thoughts about the event? How did you think it went? It was uh, obviously it was a long journey for me, you know, 285 miles to, to get up there. And, Absolutely. You know, we'd had... Uh, had a long, long week at work, and I was, I was almost sort of like, oh my god, you know, like we got to do all that that massive journey, and I wasn't sure what to expect, to be honest with you, you know. Right. I was obviously, you, you know, I came sort of, sort of dressed as Quint, if you like, you know, and yes. I was unsure whether to to do that, you know, because I thought, <laughs> well, one of two things is going to happen: I'm either going to walk in and I'll be the only guy there dressed as Quint, and they'll think I'm mental, or I'm going to walk <laughs> in, there'll be like forty Quints, you know, we'll all be staring at each other, judging each other as to like the, a, how good the costume is, you know, <laughs> like an Elvis impersonator event or something. Be all yeah, Quint imp- yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> I really didn't know what to expect, and um, you know, and 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 it was kind of it was a bit surreal, really. You know, we, we sort of parked up and walked down the road, and there and there was the Robert Shaw pub. I mean, I was like, it it almost hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh my god, there's the Robert Shaw pub. You know, it's a place that I've always wanted to go to, okay. always wanted to go and see that town. Um, and uh, yeah, we sort of walked in, and you know, we we were actually meeting some good friends of mine, Jaws fans, who were at the event, who I'd actually never met in person. You know, we were we're mm-hmm. friends online, and we just we chat every day, and we feel like family, but we'd never actually met. So, wow. to walk through the doors of the Robert Shaw Pub and then see my Jaws chums, as as we're called, you know, sure. to see each other and just go, wow, you know, here we are, uh, <laughs> and then to come out out the back and uh, and to to see the setup and see everything there, it, it was oh, it was magical. It was a bit like dreamland, you know, it's like, fantastic. oh my God, we've come home, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it was fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. The, there was a photo that I placed on the Book of Quint Instagram, uh, at Book of Quint over on Instagram.com of you and I, and um, you are wearing the M51 Quint field jacket, the authentic Quint hat. It's a photo that stood out from Hayden's collection that day. Hayden Wheeler took a, a series of photos. As I said before, your words of encouragement to me regarding the Book of Quint that meant so much that you were saying at that time when that photo was taken, what did the Book of Quint mean to you when you first encountered it and after reading it? I'm, I'm so... It tuned into the Jaws world, you know. I'm always buying Jaws things. I'm always on the on the lookout for anything new that's coming up. And uh, this did pop up on my radar through some of my friends. And I was like, you know, I had my reservations because obviously, you know, when it comes to Jaws, Jaws fans don't like remakes. You know, Correct. we've we've seen what you know, Jaws two, <laughs> three, four, and you know, there's always that sort. Of, oh, great, right, okay, another Jaws thing. Yeah. So. Initially, you know, I was a little bit standoffish about it, and uh, and I was lucky enough to uh, have a friend of mine who sent me a copy of the book because I, I actually couldn't get a copy, you okay. know, um, 
obviously you only you only did the 300 yeah. uh, limited edition release and uh, i think i did actually message you but um i wasn't able to get a copy in the in the end but a friend of mine sent me one and uh, he said listen you know you borrow it read it see what you think and uh it actually took me a few days before i was like you know do i really want to read this <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh you know i thought right okay let, let's do it and the second the second i picked it up i was just absolutely like oh man the guy gets it you know that that oh. was that was my instant thought and i turned to my other half becky and i was like oh god he gets it right like wow. you know just couldn't put the book down um started reading it and 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 obviously you know, with all the things that you've put in it, it right. just struck me straight away. This guy is a Jaws fan. This this has not been written for commercial gain or whatever. This this is a guy who's written a book because he loves it as much as we do. Uh, and that was, you know, it was quite it's quite an impact. You know, wow. like to to read a book and to have a smile on your face at all the things that come up. You know that that that's a new thing for me, especially as you know reading Jaws things. I mean, you know, sometimes you read novels and you you get a kick out of the novels, but you know when you when you're looking at Jaws stuff, there's not much that really sort of makes you go, oh wow. And that and that's what that book did wow. for me, pretty much all the way through. You know, there were so many things. Every time I got to another chapter and I saw what the chapter was called, I was like, oh here we go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was uh, yeah. It, 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 I just wanted to take like a week off work and devour the book in one hit. You know, that's, oh, that's uh, kind of how it hit me. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, now that that honestly that makes my that makes it all worthwhile right there because when I started out this process, I already did fourteen months of research. And then I started writing in October. The Jaws Obsession podcast was going to start in December. And this, that was, it had mm. to, I had to do the podcast. And I am not get out in front of people. I'm a very private person. Mm. I, I, it was very hard for me to uh, step out and start pontificating. But at certain point, if I was going to take this on, I said, I have to take my case to the fans first. Because I yeah. know that I am a huge fan. And if I had the same reaction, I was always saying, if step outside of yourself, Ryan, how, how do you look to, if you were a fan, if you're a Jaws fan, how do you look? And I would say, okay, I would want this, this, and I would want to have these prerequisites of whoever was going to take mm. this story on. I would want to see that first. Uh, does, and, and that's where I was trying to almost, with the Jaws obsession, was to take my case to the fans. What the West Houghton event was, was the culmination of all that. And that's what was yeah. really neat to see was even though the book was, we only had 300 made, that the people that could get their hands on a copy and were able to read it, the positive energy that was coming out, was, you could feel it. You could feel it at that event. Yeah, oh, without a doubt. And, and you know, go, go back to like when I first got a copy of the book and you know it was it was sent to me by somebody who ha had already got one and you know it was just the same sort of narrative everyone was saying you've got to read this like you know you you have to read this and they was coming <laughs> from people that i really respect in the jaws community so okay. i was thinking oh, okay maybe, maybe this this got this book's pretty good <laughs> you know um so uh, you know i was like well okay well i'm gonna be standoffish and I'll, I'll make my own decision and i'll read it and then after about like three chapters i was ringing everyone up going oh my god this book is amazing you know <laughs> and that's so uh, yeah you know you really kept you really captured the hearts of the jaws fans and i think that that's that's what's so important when you're going to come up with a project that involves right. yours because we're a hard, we're a hardcore group, you know, hardcore. And we're not easy to please. Hardcore. <laughs> exactly. It's, and, and, and it's yeah. Quint too. I mean, look at what, what does Quint stand for in your life? Uh, because I saw yeah. you have an entire mural on your arm dedicated to Quint and Jaws. Yeah. It's well, some of the most fantastic yeah. ink work I've ever seen. And that's oh, how dedicated you. you are. I mean, I was just like, that, that, and when I saw you there, I knew there was a, there was another level that we're reaching here. <laughs> is that when I can when I when I have people that are that take Quint so seriously come to the, the and actually are welcoming of the book, that means we kind of we're kind of on the right track here. We're we're symbiotic. We're all coming together, and that was really special yeah. for me. You have I have to really thank you. You have I just want you to know that we're all coming together, and it was just like this is really interesting, and I'm I'm excited to see where it goes. The UK is coming through big time for the book of Quint. Brilliant. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. And I, uh, it was never any doubt, having read the book, 
that people would get behind it. You know, proper Jaws fans. Okay. Uh, I yeah, I just knew that it was going to be a, a hit. And if you do manage to get it off the ground, get that get that publication out there for more people to read. I yeah. think it, the, the traction will just build. You know, I I think the hype is there for it. Absolutely, I think so. And I think the word of mouth is already. That's what it is. That the, the today's day and age, books don't um, they don't fly off the shelves. I was listening to another show about, and the author said. In order to have a, a book that flies off the shelves, you have to convince people that don't normally read books to buy the book. Mm. And yeah. I think that's what the book of Quint is going to do is that it's going it, to, and it already has happened in a way, is that people that don't normally aren't really readers or don't normally pick up a novel, mm. they'll, be in, they'll be intrigued enough by word of mouth by real Jaws fans reaching yeah. out to their families and saying, you got to read this book. And that's what I think is going to happen is that this book will spread. Once it hits the shelves, I think it's going to spread like wildfire, which is good. It's good for our cause because we were just talking, even right before this interview started, that it's just not fair that Jaws fans have been denied their rightful mm. uh, resurgence of, a, of, a, of, of this movie in many ways because of how poorly the franchise was handled back in the day. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. that's what we're doing here. What don't you think so? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, what you said just a minute ago really sort of strikes a chord, you know, I was thinking, you know, when Jaws first sort of came out, obviously the, the book caught the hype. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, word of mouth spread and the book become a bestseller. And, off the back of that, we spurred the, the movie that we know and love. But I'd imagine a lot of people that probably didn't really want necessarily delve into reading books were given the copy of Jaws and said, Lee, you've got to read this, you know. And then right. it was like, you know, this is going to be a major film. And then it sort of spiraled from that. And I think that's what the book of Quint could potentially do because from a, even from a point of view of a person that doesn't necessarily have an interest in Jaws, the book is really well written. So it, and it, it sort of draws you into the characters and it captures your imagination straight from the out. So really, you know, for Jaws fans, obviously Jaws fans are going to love this, but everyone pretty much on the planet is aware of Jaws, you know? Right, right. So if, if, the, if there's a new book that's come out, that's grabbed a bit of hype, then I see no reason why more people wouldn't look into that, read it, and then maybe we might even get more Jaws fans. Do you know what I mean? Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's got that. It's got the potential to really snowball into that. So. Snowball into that next level of fandom. You know, get into that upper Definitely. fandom, right? And I think that I think we we yeah. could, we could do that. Uh, it's, I'm excited. I'm Definitely. excited. I'm excited. Let's let's switch gears here. Dan is coming on the show because we are going to go into some Jaws lore. I talked about in my speech during the event that the dynamic of researching Robert Shaw while before writing the book of Quint, while I was researching Robert Shaw and learning about him, it made me realize I was learning about Quint. And over in, in England, over in West Houghton, I was gifted a book by Andrew Curry called Shark, Unpredictable Killers of the Sea by Thomas Helm. This book was printed in 1961. Andy, we're going to get Andy on the show. That's a, this is uh, because yeah. he's got a lot of Jaws information, and uh, he's got one that I want to bring him on the show in, in the next episode. So, um, and and so he left a card in the book, and I'm going to read the card. It says, "Dear Ryan, within the pages of this book lies the inspiration behind the Indianapolis speech. I guarantee that if you read pages 71 to 74, you will do so with Quint's voice in your mind." Thank you for creating the Book of Quint and breathing new life into the gills of the Jaws universe. Best wishes, Andrew Curry. What a guy. What a what a guy. Yeah, so, yes, he's a lovely man. He is. So I, with, He's a lovely man. With, with, <laughs> unbelievable. So I got back to the United States, and I cracked this book open. And why don't you, this is one of those moments, right, that makes the Jaws obsession <laughs> all worth it. When a treasure like this has been unearthed, when Jaws fans come together, so you have a history with this book as well, and I want you, okay. if you could at this time, describe how you first heard about the book and what exactly is on the pages 71 to 74. Okay, well, so basically I set the scene. I was working offshore. I was in uh, the South China Sea, actually, bobbing around in the ocean on a ship, and I got the opportunity to do a video call with Carl Gottlieb. Um, it was part of a, uh, a, a larger group of people that were allowed to give free sort of asked questions to him and he would answer them. Uh, and my question was, 
I need to know how did the Indianapolis speech come about? Because there were so many stories banding around about John Milius and yep. Howard Sackler and God knows who. So, yep. you know, I just thought, do you know what? I've got one opportunity. I'll ask him. So I, uh, <laughs> so, I just went for it. Um, so yeah, the Carl Gottlieb for everyone, anyone does doesn't know he's the one. He is the screenwriter. He's credited as the screenwriter for Jaws. He worked. Uh, he re, he was right on set with Sp- Spielberg at a typewriter rewriting dailies. And obviously, so, an integral part in, in all in all of that uh, that whole part of the uh, the Jaws saga. So sure, you got a chance. You're on a video call with him, and what happens? Uh, so yeah, you know, he started answering it, and um, he was very quick to jump straight in. Say, oh, you know, everyone says John Milius wrote the speech. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you now, he didn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. He said, um, I believe it. He, he said he added some bits, uh, contributed some some bits in there, like the scar, comparing the scars. He said Milius wrote mm-hmm. that. He said, but Howard Sackler had come with a speech. He said, but the speech was quite long and it was sort of, you know, it was a bit wishy washy. Right. He said, and then Robert Robert Shaw said, right, look, give me all the stuff together and I'll go away and I'll come back. And when he came back, he sat down and spoke to the whole table of people, Spielberg. Right at that know, dinner, um, that fateful dinner. At, at, the, at the fateful dinner. And yeah. he delivered the speech and Spielberg said, that's it, we'll keep that. So whilst we was having this conversation, then Carl Gottlieb sort of looks off screen and says, well, actually, you know, I can, I'm looking at the book now. It's on my bookshelf. He said, this book was brought probably by Howard Sackler, and it has the whole Herbie Robinson speech in it. And I was sort of sitting there like, what? I've never heard this before, you know. <laughs> I was sort of gobsmacked. Yeah. And he and he, actually, he said the name of the book, but the name of the book, I think, this, this book that we've found okay. was printed under different titles all around the world. So I couldn't find it. I did Google search after Google search, and I just couldn't find this book. So I got in contact with Andy Curry, who's a massive shark fan. You know, he's done dives with sharks. He's he, he's like the go-to guy. Right. And he said, well, leave it with me. A few weeks later, he got back in contact with me and he said, look, I've spoke to my friend Colin, and he's found the book. I said, right, okay. So he told me the title of the book, which was The Unpredictable Killer of the Sea by Thomas Helm. So I bought a copy on eBay right. and opened up the pages. And sure enough, there is the Indianapolis sort of section. And it's word for word <laughs> in it's, places, it's you know, uncanny. as you it's know. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It is, I mean, it, it absolutely made my blood run cold when I was reading it because I was like, you know, I just switched to the Quint monologue. You know, I've got Robert Shaw's voice in my head as I'm yep. reading it. And I'm like, there is no doubt in my mind that this book was in someone's hands who wrote that speech. There is just no doubt whatsoever. Right. And and that's um, and that's the thing. Like, explain about the date. This is the this is the thing that gets me. So this is this is how yeah. we know that, that we know that this book was definitely on set, right? This this would this book yeah. would have to have been on set, and Robert Shaw would have had access to this book. Go ahead, explain about yeah. the date. So do you know what? When I first got the book, I was so caught up in the whole, you know, the Herbie Robinson section that I did I did miss the date thing, and this was only about five or six weeks ago I was in Spain I was on holiday I had this book with me and I was just flicking through and it got to this bit and I'm actually looking at it now and it says a few minutes after midnight on June 29th 1945 and then I just stopped and I was like hang on hold on and then I I read it again and I thought that's the wrong date it's right and then I sort of went back and and I and I had to google the original story and I was like yeah that's the wrong date and then it twigged, the penny dropped. It was like, it was printed wrong in this book. And that's why when they did that writing of that speech, they didn't check it and it's in this book. Right, right. <laughs> and, that, and that must be where the source of the speech come from because there's no way that they had got the date wrong. It's, it's fantastic. That, you're right because we <laughs> all know that the, the attack was on July 29th, 1945. That's right. But in this book yep. right here on page 71, I'm looking at it right here, and we're going to put pictures on our show notes over at Telegram channel at Jaws OB at Telegram. A few minutes after midnight on June the 29th, 1945, it, it actually says a Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into the side of the big cruiser, and in a matter of minutes, she began going to the bottom. So it even uses, there's certain, um, yeah. there, there's those creative slammed into our side. Right. So, yeah. so that definitely there, this, this book, these four pages 
are definitely the inspiration for what they were deriving this, uh, what Robert Shaw was deriving, what Howard Sackler, uh, Spielberg says John Milius. I'm still not going to rule out John Milius because Spielberg is going for bat for John Milius and, and Carl yeah. Gottlieb. Yeah. So all five of these guys, because I heard Spielberg even had a hand in different parts of the script. So we have without a doubt, right? We have so we have all these these minds came together, but this book must have been on set because of this date. We're now we're zeroing in on this date. It's unbelievable, but it's not just this date. It's just the verbiage that's used in mm. this. So this was written by a Thomas Helm. Yeah, the, the questions that have been generated by this generous gift by Andy Curry to the Jaws obsession. I I zeroed in on. In recent years, it was my privilege to assist my personal friend, personal friend, Mr. Robert P. Gauze of Tarpon Springs, mm. Florida. So Gauze, G-A-U-S-E. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I think it's Gauze. Uh, to write mm. his story of the sinking for a national magazine. So I think right. what, what we're stumbling upon here is we are actually stumbling upon the actual inspiration for Quint is this guy, quarter, yeah. Quartermaster Robert P. Goss. Um, before Quite we get... Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to go through a couple more books that I have here. But um, mm. what I want to do is I want to focus on the the Herbie Robinson is... Let's see here. I'm going to read from this um, page 74. Quote, on Thursday yeah. morning when there was just light, when there was just light enough to see, Bob Goss related... I looked, quote, I looked at a man next to me and noticed that he was slumped over so that part of his head was in the water. I thought he had gone to sleep, but when I reached over to awaken him, his body upended, and I saw in a moment of horror that he had been cut in half just below the waist. <laughs> right, right there. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. There, there is. There the, it is. There, there it is. Right the there. Herbie Robinson's speech. Right. So we're, we're looking at... Um, this is and this is what's fantastic is I cross reference this through um, the I sent you the two links earlier the Benchley and Howard Sackler mm. script okay so we have we yeah. have that what what's so wild about Jaws is that there is no shooting script so we you, it was mm. constantly evolving even how even Carl Gottlieb said that there was never uh, whatever you see that is listed as the shooting script is a mishmash of different sides that were taken and collected at the time. And um, mm. so it doesn't necessarily mean that what was on that final shooting script was what they had on set. They That Carl could have typed up a completely different page and brought it to the set the next day and no one would ever know. So, but yeah. between the two scripts that I have, the Benchley Howard Sackler script and then the Benchley Carl Gottlieb script, Robert Shaw, what I wanted to zero in on was what Robert Shaw's intricacies that he put in. And Robert Shaw mm. must have come up with the name Herbie Robinson. He, mu yeah. uh, he must have, because it's not in this book, right? So it goes into there. Yeah. And then even in the type script of that's the eventually Carl Gottlieb script that we do have, it says Her Herbie Robinson, um, a, a Boson's mate. Robert Shaw added from Cleveland, Boson's mate, baseball player, Boson's mate. So Robert Shaw mm. actually put in these little things that made, so that's where I, when I was writing the book of Quint, if it was important for Robert Shaw to add in little details like from Cleveland and baseball player, then that would have been important yeah. for Quint. And that's, those Definitely. are, those are little thoughts that you can actually establish and extract and make a characterization out of Quint by using what was Robert Shaw's final input into that speech. One other one was mm. I was I what I noticed in the script for let me just pull up this script right here. So it says we didn't see the first shark till we'd been in the water about a ha about an hour, thirteen footer near enough a blue. The mm. me you measure that by judging the dorsal to the tail. So that was what Carl Gottlieb had written down. Robert right. Shaw turned it to tiger. Yeah. Okay, and that's why I focused on Quint's fascination with the tiger shark okay that that was the and that yeah. was the whole thing is as you see what happens with the tiger shark during the sinking of the indianapolis during their trying to the surviving mm -hmm. in those five days um i focused on that because that was important enough for robert shaw to turn the blue shark into the tiger shark in the final speech that and that yeah. that's what i'm seeing here is so 
what you've given me was this launching pad. So now I cross-reference Bob Gauze into my other uh, books here. And right. it's just fascinating. It's just fascinating. I, I actually just stumbled upon this in preparation for our call here. First, I look into the ship's manifest, and uh, Bob Gauze is, let's see, uh, let's see, G-A-U-S-E. So it says Robert P. Gauze, uh, Quartermaster One. He's he's on the ship's manifest. If I go back and I look in the index, this is really cool stuff. This is just so cool. On page 167, at one point, Bob Gauze swam away. So this is from In Harm's Way by Doug Stanton, the famous book re- recounting the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Uh, Bob Gauze is mentioned. At one point, Bob Gauze swam away from the group to aid an exhausted sailor who was on the verge of drowning. The boy had clearly gone out of his head. At the sight of the fish circling below, he was waving his hands and calling for help. As Gauze paddled out, he was intercepted immediately by a large dorsal fin knifing towards him. So he swam as fast as he could back to the group. The boy in distress soon disappeared. In Dr. Haynes' group uh, on Tuesday... Where most were dressed only in their gray life vests, one sailor would wake up from sleep, half stupefied and half dreaming, and give a buddy next to him a good morning shove. The guy didn't respond when the sailor pushed again. The friend's body tipped over like a child's toy and bobbed away. He'd been eat- he'd been eaten in half right up to the hem of his life vest. This is almost in that same wow. section with Bob Goss is talking about the Herbie Robinson character um, that was bitten in half. So as I kept going, I looked over and uh, page 271, where the author recounts kind of what happened to the survivors after the sinking. He has a small passage here. He says, Bob Gauze returned to Florida as a commercial fisherman. His sideline exploits as a shark hunter are said to said by some to have served as the inspiration for the Captain Quint character in Jaws. Um, no way. Yeah, it says it right here. Whatever it had had happened to them on the water was in the past. They moved into the stream of America and they worked. Okay, so yeah, so there 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 is the first hint that this guy or he was known as or he some thought him as a shark hunter and he was the inspiration for Captain Quint in Jaws. So that's in that's in in harm's way. And this is all sp- this is all spawning from this book, The Unpredictable Killer of the Sea by Thomas Helm. And and now this is, I'm going to get to the, the crescendo here. We're actually stumbling, <laughs> we're actually unearthing some really interesting, this this is in a de facto way. This is this, history, man. <laughs> this is, yeah, this, this is the, this is the real life where we've found by name, the real life man who was the inspiration for Captain Quint. The book Indianapolis by Lynn Vincent and Sarah Vladek. Okay, this is a huge book. We're talking, this is like 600 pages. But in chapter 16, on page 265, dusk fell, siphoning precious light from the rescue scene. There were now 30 survivors aboard Mark's Dumbo. In addition to James Smith, Edgar Harrell, Spooner, McKissick, and Woolston, Mark's had scooped up quartermaster Bob Gauze and Cox and Lewis Irwin. So we know that Bob Gauze was rescued on the PBY flown by uh, Lieutenant Commander Marks at that time. So that so that fateful PBY that went down and landed, and mm. everybody was waiting for their turn to get on. Bob Gauze was one of those guys that was on Marks PBY. So again, we have a similarity to Quint. All right, and we're we're gonna keep yeah. going. <laughs> We're going to keep going here because this is unbelievable stuff. The last one is going to really get you. The last one. I'm, I'm going to save it the, the best one for last. I can barely wait. Yeah, yeah. This is really cool stuff. See, page 302. When it was all said and done and the survivors were then taken to uh, the Admiral Spruance arrived at the hospital to give Purple Hearts to uh, the survivors of the Indianapolis. When Spruance and McVeigh, McVeigh being the captain, uh, of the Indianapolis, mm-hmm. got to quartermaster Bob Gauze. The captain said, "If you quote, if you decide to stay in the Navy, I'll see to it that you make chief. Bob Gauze responds, thank you, sir, but no thanks, Gauze said. After what he had just been through, he was going to get out of the Navy double quick, get out of the Navy double quick, and go home to Florida. 
So we know that Bob Gauz left and got out and went to Florida, but was offered to the rank of chief if he stayed in. Very similar to the events of the Book of Quint, where Quint stays in and makes the rank of chief, but then gets out later on. Now, this is the, the, uh, the last part. We're going to keep, we're going to stay on Mr. Gauz here. Okay. So this is going to hit you close to home here. <laughs> For years, uh, this is from page 389 of the book Indianapolis. So for years, Bob Gauze, the former quartermaster, would jolt awake at night screaming and bathed in sweat, nightmare images of circling sharks melting away in the wakeful darkness. Gauze's first job out of the Navy was as a sponge diver and a commercial fisherman, and he made it his personal mission to kill every shark he could find. If he found baby sharks trapped in his nets, Gauze dragged them into his boat and took grim satisfaction in watching them die. Every time he remembered the faces of the shipmates he'd lost, it renewed his thirst for vengeance. So here we have three books. I have three books in front of me, In Harm's Way, Indianapolis, and then the book that you're bringing, that you're introducing to the show that was gifted by Andy Curry, Unpredictable Killers of the Sea, Thomas Helm, by Thomas Helm. This is a 1961 book, which uses verbatim between page 71 and 74, uses passages are almost verbatim to the final Indianapolis speech. What do you think? Do you think that we stumbled upon the actual real-life inspiration for Quint? Well, I think I think it's pretty hard to deny that, isn't it? Right. That, that is incredible. You <laughs> totally, totally blown me away there. I mean, you know, I didn't realize about the other two books. So, you know, with that, with that all adding up with the extra one, then wow, man, it, what a what a discovery! <laughs> it's, it's it's unbelievable, Brilliant. right? We I, I went into this thinking, okay, we we're going to find out where the they got the the, the speech came from, but we're really mm. we, we really stumbled onto this. Quartermaster Robert Gauze, G-A-U-S-E. If anyone out there wants to do some searches, we're going to have to start scouring the world for pictures. Uh, let's, you know, yeah. let's. I'll put this out to the Jaws obsession, Mister, uh, uh, and definitely maybe Andy Curry. We'll get him. We'll get him on it as well, because yeah. this is unbelievable that we that through these three books we've kind of triangulated and uh, and I like that it triangulated it. We we got the. Uh, you can actually hone in on that this is the guy that originated the Herbie Robinson story, the the verbiage of two torpedoes slammed into our side. He was in the water waiting for his chance to get on the PBY. He got onto the PBY, as you see Quint does in the Book of Quint. It's really amazing how this is all coming together like it was meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's just all dropping into place, isn't it? It, it really I mean... is. <laughs> <laughs> who knew from just uh, that that meeting the other week you know that this yes. would snowball into into what it has you uh, know it's incredible right from just from from that thing from the writing the book of quint and then we go over to and we all meet in england and then this book is passed off and then you and i are we able to put our heads together and we actually lock onto this and we've just unearthed something that is groundbreaking this is the the inspiration for Quint. This has never I don't believe this has ever been talked about in any that that Mr. Gauze has never been mentioned in the as in this sort of in this lexicon in this in this way. And I think this is exciting. I, I got goosebumps. I don't know about you. I'm buzzing, honestly. I'm just <laughs> grinning from ear to ear. It's like, you know, I, I knew that we'd stumbled upon something really interesting, but uh, I didn't uh, I didn't see where it was going to lead down a rabbit hole. I mean, this is yeah. Yeah, it's pretty monumental. This I think is, most of Jaws fans would agree. I know. It's episode 64, this is going to go down. This is going to be one of the revelations <laughs> here. <laughs> I'm going to go through this book even more because I believe this book called Shark Unpredictable Killers of the Sea by Thomas Helm. There's passages in this book that talk about the 1916 attacks in New Jersey. Yeah. And yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, the um, the 1916 attacks in New Jersey, as well as, like, there's little things like, um, for example, page 66, it says, also, newspapers, especially in tourist-conscious areas, are loath to report that a person <laughs> was eaten by a shark unless there is irrefutable <laughs> evidence to substantiate the claim. In the accounts listed in this chapter, however, chambers of commerce and other groups interested in tourist trade have had to go by the board for each, incidents is, for each incident is too well documented. 
So we're talking is that it even almost describes some of the plot elements <laughs> of Jaws. And I think Carl Gottlieb obviously had access to this book because um, when Hooper, I'm going to go into this a little bit more. I'm going to, I need a little bit more time to digest this. But when Hooper talks about yeah. the uh, territoriality theory that he agrees with, mm -hmm. I think it comes from this book. And I think that we can prove <laughs> right. that if I can, if I'm going to digest this a little bit more, but it talks about the 1916 attacks in New Jersey and how it was a rogue shark. It was a loner shark. And once that shark was dispatched and they found the digestive system is very slow. So they found pieces inside the shark of a prior victim. And what they were, what they did was they, they said, well, well, then the, 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 the attack stopped. So there was this territoriality theory that's kind of cooked up into Definitely. this book. And I was just like, this book's unbelievable. Yeah. It really is. It was almost like this was the shark manual that, uh, that Carl Gottlieb <laughs> yeah. had, that Robert Shaw had. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, there. it's all there. It's all there. And I want to <laughs> thank you so much for coming on this show. This is unbelievable. Andy and yourself introduced this book to me. And this is the magic of the Jaws obsession is that I always said this was an information trading post. This is not a one-man show. We all have to come together to find these great things. And I'm excited. So, yeah. so Dan, what? Uh, I'm, uh, I am so excited, what, man. What do, what do you think? What do you think, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, it's, it's hard to argue with, isn't it? I mean, 48 years later, we're still discovering stuff and, um, you know. Yes. The spirit of Jaws is when and truly alive. <laughs> great point. Great point. The greatest movie ever made because it keeps paying dividends 48 years later. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Definitely. Unbelievable. So uh, Dan, how about you tell everybody in the Jaws obsession, all the listeners out there, how they can get a hold of you on social media? Yeah, by all means. I mean, I've got uh, a, a YouTube channel out there, which is Jaws Mad. Um, the video that I've got on there is uh, is the one of me chatting to Carl Gottlieb where we discovered this book. So feel free to check that out. And uh, my Instagram um pages is the same jaws mad so just search for that and um yeah you'll you'll uh, you'll see me on there and um be great to have a few new listeners and uh yeah some new friends to catch up with jaws mad over at youtube and at instagram.com Instagram. I'll, uh, yep i'll put those links in the description of this broadcast as well so everyone can uh, follow you as well Fantastic. from there so thanks, hey Dan. Brilliant. Thank you so much for for this. this. What a special episode! Thank you so much. Oh, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute privilege. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Buzzing. Okay. <laughs> All right. You. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Cheers, man. Thank you. What a great time for discovery on the Jaws obsession on episode sixty four here. I wanted to keep this going. This is very important to the narrative, to the history of all of this. Uh, what we are tapping into. So we need to recap. So so just for a quick recap here, we know that Benchley, Peter Benchley found inspiration for his version of Quint in, in Frank Mundus. Frank Mundus was the professional shark fisherman that caught the record great white shark off of Montauk that inspired Peter Benchley to write Jaws. We do know that Robert Shaw found inspiration in Craig Kingsbury and Lynn Murphy for the acting performance and the way he portrayed the character of Quint on screen. But what we're realizing here is when it came time for the speech, the USS Indianapolis speech, the survivor of the USS Indianapolis, Robert Shaw and everyone else who touched that speech found inspiration in the real-life testimony of quartermaster first class Robert Pritchard Gauze. Robert Pritchard Gauze was born on January 20th, 1920 and passed away at the age of 88 on June 18th, 2008. From St. Petersburg Times, survivor Robert P. Gauze, 88, of Tarpon Springs, Florida, passed away this week on Wednesday, June 18th. He is survived by his wife of 67 years, Norma, as well as two sons, two daughters, 12 grandchildren, and 19 great-grandchildren. I've included a photo of Robert Goss on the title card of this episode as we lock in the memory of Quartermaster First Class Robert Goss into the Jaws lexicon. I thought it was only fitting that we would leave with words by Mr. Goss from an audio recording interview that I found of his on YouTube. So let's take a moment to listen to words by the man who has passed on, but his tale of what he experienced in the water 
1945 will never be forgotten. But you'd see a shark about this long in the daytime and it'd be perfectly clear water if the oil broke away and you could see down there and he'd look about that long and when he got up on the surface he'd be about four or five feet between his fin and his tail and he'd swim up as close as this gentleman to you and kind of grin at you like that and he'd swim round and round the group, round and round the group. I never did have a shark try to bite me. But in the picture Jaws, maybe some of you saw that, this fellow Quint had to have some reason for killing the big white shark. And he said that he was aboard the USS Indianapolis when it was sunk and that he shook his buddy one morning and he had been eaten at the bottom by the bottom of his life jacket and he was dead laying there in his life jacket. Quint, I understand, never was aboard the Indianapolis. They took this out of a book that I helped write 25 years ago and this happened to me and I shook a buddy of mine thinking that he'd gone to sleep and when I shook him he rolled upside down and the shark had eaten him. You ladies know how your hands get all wrinkled up when you're, you've you had them in water too long? Well, I stayed in water so long that the soles of my feet came off. And when you get in water that long and a fella kicks you, it creates an ulcer. Just a little while after that, a plane flew over. For years, I couldn't even talk about that plane. And this plane that came out that morning... Uh, the pilot lives in California. His name's Gwen. He's a very close friend of mine today. Boy, we were down there waving and hollering and taking on as loud as we could, and you know how much good that does when these planes are probably flying on instruments. The pilot banked around like this, and four or five fellows in my group went crazy and drowned right then. They couldn't stand it. He dropped a five-gallon can of water with a life jack jacket wrapped around it. He dropped it about a 100 yards from us, and I said, man, why'd you drop it out there so far? He said, Bobby said, I didn't want to drop it on you and kill some of you. So he dropped it off to one side, and I was the only man in my group with enough strength. I had rested. I, I swam out and got the five gallons of water. I didn't worry about the shark. I just swam out there and got it. It had burst open, and all the fresh water was gone. There was an empty can there, and, uh, and I saw this seaplane come out. A, a PBY came out and landed, and he was taxiing around, picking guys up, and this big aventure had sent off a radio message. He said, send some help quick. He quit sending it by code and said, there's, I'll fly over a group and there's 25 men in it, and I'll fly over them again in 15, 20 minutes, there's 20. He said, these guys are dying like flies. And they're scattered all over the Pacific out here. Send some help. And the message never did get to the commander of the base at Kalalu. They sent one lousy PBY out there, and he landed against orders. And it split the rivets on the plane when he landed. And I could see this plane circling around, and he wasn't picking up groups of fellas. Fellas began to scatter when the help was coming like that, and he was picking up scattered guys. So I told this fellow that was hanging on the raft, I said, Hey, you want to get on this raft? I'll trade you my place on the raft for your life jacket. And I swam then and cut this plane off. And I was the last man that was picked up on the PBY. Thank you.